New England. Um, I'm at Roger Williams University, the law school, to start up a community economic development clinic. So the clinics are basically <coughs> like a law office that the law schools run with students as interns or taking each semester, and I get to work on real projects with real clients. So I supervise the work that they're doing, and I teach a class twice a week next semester, and it goes along with that, teaching them how to interview clients, counsel, all that fun stuff. And we have a Alive. The first semester building up this program. So Sam's here. She's a third year student. She's graduating next semester. She's one of the four pioneer students in the clinic. Um, our clinic works largely with nonprofits and small businesses on transactional matters. So nothing, we're not suing anyone or we're not defending any laws, <coughs> but everything else in between. So helping businesses get formed figuring out what type of business to, uh, entity to form, tax issues, contracts, leases, all that stuff, tax exempt status for nonprofit bylaws and everything. Um, so I'm coming from New York. I've been in Michigan during the last school year, but in New York I worked a lot with the Center for Family Life. Uh, is anyone familiar with them? Yeah. So they're a large social services agency in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and for a number of years they've had this adult employment program where they would meet people in the community and try to put them into jobs and they realized there was a large population of folks that they couldn't put into traditional employment um, situations largely around work authorization status. So they found the co-op model through wages, or had heard about wages out in California, so let's try to do the co-op model here. So back in 2007, they started organizing women around house cleaning. So they have a house cleaning co-op and I work with them a year later, because I met them at a conference, and they called and said, should we form an LLC, should we form a co-op corporation, what should we do, we, we're not sure about work authorization, immigration issues, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, let's just step back, and it led to about a year's worth of research with a bunch of folks to figure out what entity made the best sense for them. We worked on bylaws, that took about a year or so of you know, showing up and going to meetings and really talking with them about all these little things. So we showed up late to a meeting, what's the penalty, or what's the incentive, and kind of all of those questions group largely led. They had a facilitator for this lawyer so we could kind of provide some insight about what the different statutes says or the law said if there was anything in particular or just say give some input based on what we're hearing. So we were really involved in that process. As other questions came up, they had a, at one point there was a handy person co-op they were trying to form. Um, so people who would do small jobs around like construction or other odds and things in the home. So there were some legal issues that came up there that ended up being part of the reason why it wasn't going to work as a business model. So we helped them do some research around that. There's a child care co-op that's up and running beyond care, um, and now they have an elder care co-op called Little Steps Co-op. So, you know, uh, so that was largely my experience in helping the co-ops. And so when I came to Rhode Island, that's always been on my radar. I know it's, it's cool to be here and meet Mr. Roots folks because I was at the conference back in the OB in Pittsburgh. Um, and this is kind of the birthplace of the co-op movement, right, in the U.S., New England, Boston, and Massachusetts. It's fun to be here. And so when I came to Rhode Island, I really wanted to seek out what co-op work is happening, who's doing what, and that's how I ended up running into several folks. And Sol Chariots, um, who we were connected basically through the conference in Philly this past year, and through them, and so all of that is to say, interested in co-op work, have a lot of experience, try to give you some flavor of the work that you could have a lawyer doing with you. I think just thinking off the top of my head some questions you might want to think about or, you know, who are the potential sources for legal help that you have available to you? What are they like? You know, is it a university clinic group that can devote students in a project and come to your meetings and be there? Do you want them to play that role? What kind of role do you want them to play? Do you have discrete questions that you want to kind of throw at them? Or you know, someone from outside who that you someone has a connection to, someone who can answer some questions, you want to do it do it that way and just get some questions or what how do you want to set up that relationship? I think that's important to think about. You don't want the lawyer to come in and sort of take the steam or the power out of the workers, right? So someone who can really support the larger mission of your organization and the group really figuring out what's best for them. And then someone who's also trying to think creatively with you. So you want to do one thing, they kind of say, oh no, you can't do it, you know. Someone is sort of willing to say, okay, what are some options, what are ways that we can
can do that give you some pushback. So those are things to think about, I think, if you're working with lawyers. So we got an email with a few questions um, from Matt and me. What I'm curious, and so starting with those, we can just toss it out to you all and see if anyone had any particular questions. Largely the topics that were focused on, that were mentioned in the email had to do with the difference between independent contractor versus employees, issues around probationary periods, immigration questions, um, co-ops and nonprofit organizations. We covered a lot of that, but if you want us to talk about it more from a legal standpoint, we can. And then youth co-ops and specific questions about youth co-ops. So anything in particular that anyone's dying to know? Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I would just, it, it may be slightly up, uh, 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 out of the uh, off, off topic, but is there the equivalent to your clinic happening in Worcester? It's not, so Boston College has a community development yeah. clinic, and I know nothing in Worcester. There. Is there a law school? Western, I don't know. There's no one with, of all the colleges, and no one's offering any. Okay. That's too bad, that sounds like it. But maybe the Boston folks would help her. From here, I mean, yeah, maybe, you know. Rhode Island is closer. <laughs> but well, it, may be a, it may be a jurisdictional thing. I'll be barred in Massachusetts soon, but I think we might run it up against yeah. the state law and the students to work on projects. But I'm happy to, I have some mass, mass connections that we can kind of explore and see if this is interesting. Northeastern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Specific issue. Um, this might already been covered, but what are the legalities of co-ops having their own bank accounts if they're being like incubated by a nonprofit and they're not like, or even beyond that, just like us right now, we're doing business, but we we aren't incorporated. So maybe is there like some reality issue with us having our own bank account and other doing other things? You can open a bank account as an unincorporated association or just open a separate bank account if you're maybe you're being incubated by a nonprofit and it's, you, the, the bank shouldn't have a problem opening an account for you. Does that kind of answer it? Yeah. yeah. We would be opening an account under Worcester Roots, right? No? That was the option that we could say, but I think there might be some other internal issues that we can't. Right. But from a legal standpoint, <coughs> someone from Worcester Roots would probably have to be on the account. Um, is, uh, is it required to have a separate account if it were a separate fiscally sponsored uh, entity? Or can they all be under the same central? There's no legal requirements for anything. If you're fisc so you're being fiscally sponsored, is that the setup? Mm -hmm. By Worcester Roots and people make donations to you. We haven't and actually and really exercised any like real benefits, benefits or any like non profit activity. Right. But I think it's largely how you, you how you agree to separate and manage the money if it's easier for it to be a separate account or so, Continue. yeah, but if we have our own bank account, we do our own bookkeeping and stuff like that, we do business. Maybe it's more internal stuff, I guess. And what you kind of Yeah, I, I have a question on, on kind of like that and because, so our co-op is thinking on having like a start funding, like, start a savings account till we like buy the land and can start with the project and there's been like some you know concerns if like if it's under one person's name and that person just decide to take off with money or mm -hmm. like what kind of what kind of uh, documents or what, like we don't want everybody to have signatures and then if one person decides not to sign then we cannot take the money out or something in that Realm. So, like, what kind of is there any agreement that you each have now amongst all of you together? Well, like right now we're all like super friends and super happy, but, but like bylaws <laughs> or an operating <laughs> agreement or something that sort of 
governs or uh, lays No, I guess that we just starting on yeah. like, okay, now we're gonna start putting money away and we like, do we want to do it under our names? And you know, like, we, we wanted to start a fund <coughs> together, but what kind of agreement that it will be you know, legal, so if something happened, or if somebody dies, or if something happened to have, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think you do run the risk if someone, if you don't have an agreement and you're just opening it up under one person's name, right. they can probably mm -hmm. do whatever they want, but you likely want to put in place, okay, here's who the group is, these are the members, we're authorizing this person to have access to the bank account under these conditions, you know, so something that lays out mm -hmm. and everyone agrees to and signs to, and then you're binding that person and they're responsible. That way, I would talk to the bank also in terms of some of that those legality, those legal, legal issues in setting up the account. How many people should you have as signers, or do you want there to be two people to sign off on things, mm -hmm. like two people, you know, whatever it is? So I think you could largely work out what Just you want. Just to have a simple yeah. agreement. We don't need to go to a lawyer. The lawyer has to. If we have an internal agreement and it's in writing. That was the question that, you know, what you guys, like, if, if you think that's, that's something that we should just <coughs> pay $50 or something to someone to see it for, and say that's right, if this is legal or not legal. Uh, the sort of the conservative answer is yeah, because there might be things that rules off the cuff don't really aren't really identifying with respect to what bank accounts and that, you know, so what, yeah, I would say it's worth having someone think about some more. I think the, um, the job of the Gitas class isn't here, but the, um, one of the main questions that we all had that we're, I think we're all curious about, I know I am, is about um, people under 18 being members of the cooperative on paper, like being shareholders in the corporation and members of an LLC. And from what I could tell, it seemed like you're allowed to be a shareholder in a corporation if you're under 18, but then it's like, what does that actually mean in terms of your responsibility and liability, and can you have a co-op that's made up entirely of people under 18, or is there some kind of a proxy situation, or what, you know, what could, what could you do? Yeah, so just briefly, and I think that this is more complicated, and I know in Michigan, the uh, law school there is working with the youth co-op, and there's, they spent the summer or the semester looking into some of these issues, so oh, I really? can talk with them and connect. Um, but just from a very brief search over the last couple of days, it looks like you can't, there's nothing that's barring someone under 18 from being a member of an LLC or a shareholder of stock in a corporation. But I think that there might be, I don't know about the tax ramifications and how that works when you file taxes individually or connect to Guardian or how that works. The other piece of it is that in Massachusetts, at least, I haven't looked at Rhode Island, but on, until you're 18, you are not competent to contract, which means that if you're under 18, you can sign a contract, but the law treats you as someone who isn't competent, isn't there, isn't able to actually sign. So if you are under 18, you sign a contract and go, actually, I don't, I don't really know what this means. <laughs> I don't want to participate. The law will just void the contract. You as the under 18 year old can make it go away. And that, understandably, might make someone a little anxious about contracting with someone under 18. What if yeah. they don't know you're under 18? <laughs> <laughs> you might get away with it, but the other, the other key issue is if you're forming and operating it from the LLC and you have an operating agreement, that's a contract. So you're saying we're all under 18 and we're going to bind ourselves to these things, but at any time, any of the internal members, if they decide to void it, what happens to your LLC? It's a series of contracts that keeps you together, and if you can void those in time because you're under 18, what problems does that present? Mm -hmm. So it's internal and those external questions. So I guess, like, I mean, is there, I mean, maybe this is too big a question to ask on the spot, but is it, I mean, can you think of any way that um, a youth-owned co-op or a co-op can be owned by people under 18 in, a, in any way that's really real without exposing them to liabilities that they shouldn't be exposed to? Or, um, or maybe it's an easy answer, no. <laughs> I mean, is the law just, just that adamant? No, no, I think there's flexibility. I think you'd want to see 
one, to make sure you, depending on what the industry is, if it's something that's somewhat risky or there's lots of liabilities, will insurance even cover? Will they provide coverage for the youth run co op? And once you explain to them what a co op is, they probably get that. <laughs> will they <laughs> still be, will they be comfortable providing that coverage? And that would be saying, protect that, everyone's protected, but at the minimum, I think you want to make sure you have insurance. If you have the insurance, then I think. If that insurance is protecting them from the outside world, that's probably that's good. But is there some way to insure them from each other? We probably want to figure out how that could be done. I think it's worth thinking through. For sure. Yeah. Um, what going along with Stacy said would like a like parent print like a legal guardian or maybe like could someone do um, like a power of attorney uh, for a, uh, an underage person so that that is legally binding in such a way um, so that I'm just trying to think of a way that someone under 18 could be a, a, a figurehead adult kind of thing. Yeah, I'd like to ask that in the email that someone I mean, I've looked into it. I don't know. I know that's familiar with Because uh, it seems to me that if it were a figurehead adult, it actually would, the adult would have, would not be a figurehead in the eyes of law. The adult would be the one that's responsible. Certainly, the parent would be responsible, and you're envisioning yeah. that, but you're saying the parent trusts the kid and says, or wants the kid to pursue what they're doing, because I'll take the liability, you still be part of the co op. Is that a yeah, just make it so that it would no longer be um, incompetence. How can you remove? Because obviously, I uh, was super confident. So, like, how do you? It's one of those terms of laws you get insulting. Yeah. It's just kind of there. It's obviously not true, but it's just a matter of how the laws are looked at. That's an interesting thought. I mean, I'd be curious how they would view that. But then, how would that work functionally? So, would you ask the parents to say, okay, for your youth to be a member of the co op, you need to sign, but you can't. We don't want you making decisions. Your child that gets to make decisions, which might interfere with the nature of the call itself. But you have owners who have no control, and you have non-owners who have control. Does that make sense in terms well, of? Wouldn't it? I feel like the only role of the parent parental guardian would be to bring confidence to that uh, so underage person during the time of signing, so because that's the only child thing. Is like because yeah. that, that's their only that. real issue, right, with a, a youth is that they but aren't the, confident to sign and become a member on it because they can't do things with the co-op is just become, like, deciding to become a member on it. Yeah, but then, like, you're contracting with outsiders and you have a contract that the co-op needs to execute. Who's going to sign that? The youth can, but then there's, like, issue with that. Yeah. But I think it's more than just getting over the hurdle. So, I mean, there is no hurdle to them right. signing and being a member is more right at each there are many times when you're running a business and you have to sign a contract and you only and you need someone under 18 period in the club to do that because otherwise okay. you're signing all these contracts that don't be worth while to do and they're not the contracts so you need to be right. and I, I mean they're they're voidable they're voidable they're still valid yeah. the other party can't Avoid it. Yeah, that's the real thing. Other businesses, they're, they're going to realize now they're held to that contract no matter what. It's the other party, it's the person who's under 18 right. who can walk away.